Okay, so um, welcome everyone to, to this new Ospology session. This is Ospology number two. And today's topic is about mentoring and talent management within open source ecosystems. Uh, but before starting with the topic, uh, here are some OSPO and Tudo news I would like to share with you first. Um, so the first one, we have two new Tudo members on board. Uh, you can see that in the OSPO landscape uh, we are building and we hope new contributors could add. Um, if anyone here has an OSPO or are starting OSPOs, uh, they can share their logos there uh, through a pull request. Uh, also, yesterday we launched the second um, OSPO news, <coughs> the new to the newsletter. Um, you can see the tweet where the um, the post was uh, posted. And also, if you would like to add uh, content to the next OSPO, uh, OSPO news, you can do so in the GitHub repo we've created for that. Um, the upcoming OSPO events, we have OSPOCon uh, that is going to be uh, in Seattle and also virtual for those one who cannot attend. And also on October, that will be on September, at the end of September and on October uh, 6th, uh, we will have OSPOCon Europe in London. And the news is that the, the schedule for OSPOCon Europe is finally live, so you can go and check. Uh, the amazing talks we, we have there. It's really interesting talks. Um, also, the OSPO guides. Um, the Tudor Group has a section in the tutorgroup.org website where we share guides uh, to improve um, well knowledge and education for OSPOs. So uh, we have launched uh, two new guides. The one is about managing career development within OSPOS and organizing and managing open source events. We also uh, have OSPO discussions in uh, the GitHub um, repo. So there are the uh, there are three um, new um, discussions with CLAs and what our names are for OSPOs and determining your OSPO budget. Some of them have already been resolved and other are just open and people can go there and share their thoughts if you want. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, this is uh, an important topic. Um, I've heard a lot of people asking if um, OSPOLOGY is open to anyone, and indeed it is. And we would like to hear from all the community for new topics, people that want to uh, share their ideas, or maybe they can offer to be a speaker, or they have some speakers on mind that can talk and, and share their knowledge there. Um, also take part in the voting process of the upcoming uh, topics we, we will share here. And of course, improve documentation. You have all this info of how to contribute, uh, who can contribute, and, and so on in the um, in the following repo uh, link I added there. And that's all for uh, all the OSPO news for uh, today's um, session. Let's go with the OSPOs of the month. Uh, the OSPO of the month this time is Red Hat and US Bank. As you can see, Gil is here, but Leslie, who represented Red Hat, um, wasn't able to make it. So we are really sorry she could not join us. But Gil is amazing, um, and I'm really sure you will learn a lot uh, with him. So let me, before starting, let me share some uh, some uh, facts about Gil. Gil has been in the OSPO industry for more than 10 years, right, Gil? I so, yeah. And you started in open source at, um, how was the name? Um, Fidelity well, Investments. Yeah, I was Fidel actually at Fidelity Investments, um, although I wasn't really pro open source there. I was kind of like not exactly a fan of open source, but I, I've since learned better. Uh, but I did start get my start uh, 
back uh, back at at a financial services company. Mm -hmm. And from there, you created uh, the open source program office at Yahoo. Yes. And then uh, from at Verizon and AOL. Am I yep. right? Okay. Yep. Yep. Wow. We merged those together into like there was the Yahoo and AOL merged together. Um, they're mm -hmm. part of Verizon, so we included Verizon as part of that as well. And um, and that was a very very large a uh, very large hospital, but very tech uh, very tech focused. Well, awesome. And then you also uh, are I know you're a really active member in the Twitter group. You're everywhere and also giving lectures in um, about open source in universities and also sharing knowledge in blogs, articles, podcasts about open source. So yeah, um, I will share uh, in the channel um, the um, all the social media channels of Gil in case you want to follow him uh, while he is presenting. So you can, if you have any further questions um, in the near future, you can just go. I, I think uh, Gil will be more than welcome to to answer to those questions. So yeah, I I pass this to you, Gil. Um, your turn. And yes, let me know when do you want me to um, change the slides at any cool. time. So so first of all, thank thank you, Anna, for that. And um and and just a shout out to to Leslie uh, and to Red Hat. Uh, they're awesome, and it's it, it's a shame that they weren't able to join us um, this time. Uh, but uh, Red Hat has a fantastic open source program. They've been running this for a long time and some really amazing uh, engineers there. And uh, and they serve as an interesting contrast because they're they're such an open source deep company. I mean, their entire core through and through is open source. Um, and, and in a little bit of a contrast, I'll admit that the open source program that we're starting at US Bank um, is different because the bank, as, as many banks are, um, are old, they're pre-digital. I mean, the bank that, that I work at was uh, founded about 160 something years ago. So a little bit before the internet. And, um, and as such, the non-digital native companies have a different uh, sort of, th they've, they've baked in technology a little differently. Um, so we're building an OSPO there, uh, and I'm very excited about it. We have uh, three people currently in the OSPO, each of whom uh, have extensive experience in OSPOs and in, in OSPOs uh, at large name companies that uh, you're all very familiar with, um, which, which is really to say that we're very serious about the larger modernization effort that the bank is going through, uh, where we're really examining a lot of our technology uh, and, and in the midst of making some pretty innovative improvements that are uh, proving quite well. Um, and we've and our executives recognize that in order for that to be successful, open source is a front and center strategic pillar of how we do that. Okay, so that's great. US Bank is pretty pretty interesting place and we're building an OSPO, uh, but we're here to talk about talent and talent acquisition. And it's a little strange because like, what is what is an open source program dealing with technology and licenses? What do we have to do with talent acquisition? And strangely enough, um, the concept of talent acquisition comes up quite a bit, especially when pitching an OSPO to executives. Almost every OSPO person that I've spoken to in their pitch deck mentioned something about, and it would improve acquiring tech talent. Um, which is again curious, but for those of you who are actually in this business, um, you know this well, and I'm sure you can chime in in the, in the comments and questions. And for those of you who aren't, um, you recognize that there's something special about tech talent. There's quite um, a desire for organizations to compete by getting the right technologists. Okay, so in order to focus on this topic, I put a couple of questions here, um, and the the proposal for the next 15 minutes or so is that we address these questions and through doing so, um, maybe it'll become a little more clear why, um, why companies, uh, why open source program offices have a relationship to talent acquisition. The questions, as you see, um, there's, you know, we use this term tech company. So we'll talk about like, what does it mean to be a tech company as opposed to not being a tech company? Um, I'm going to talk about tech branding, which I'll try to define uh, and connect it to open source, share with you a playbook that I've used in the past and that I'm going to be using in, in the OSPO that, um, that I'm uh, involved in now, um, and then really reaching out to you to fit in. Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll have an additional slide really to talk about the, and then once you join the company, you know, how does open source help, help with your career? 
So with that, Anna, if you can advance to the next slide, um, I want to show you a picture. So uh, this is sort of a standard S-curve around technology adoption. It's the cumulative um, uh, distribution curve, where if you think about all technologies, they, they basically go through this sort of curve and you know how narrow the curve is and where exactly the lines are may differ. But this is everything from you know the invention of electricity to laptops to cloud computing, where um, somebody creates the idea and maybe works with a small number of people to customize that idea and to, to make it you know, useful and to understand what the parameters are. And then there's this surge of productization where uh, entrepreneurial folks come in and say, wait, there's a product here. Uh, we ought to be able to make it uh, available to the masses. So if you think about laptops, maybe in the 70s, um, you know, we were thinking of laptops and desktops, uh, microchip, microcomputers. Um, and and <clears throat> in the 70s and 80s, we were able to buy kits and, and build them at home. Uh, and then it came the time where it's like, no, actually, you can productize these. And, and today, laptops are a utility. Like, you don't necessarily need to know all the bits and pieces of a laptop. You just need to know whether you're buying the $500 one, the $1,000 one, or the $2,000 one. And based on the price point, you get a laptop. Um, so we're sort of at that commodity. And, and this is true, again, with all these technologies. Uh, early, and with open source as well, early projects are active. Open source vendors play in, in the productization. And then as uh, projects become stable um, or in some cases static, um, the uh, you know you have this sort of utility phase. So if you can do me a favor and click, um, there's you know sort of this movement shift left where, oh, that's back right. So large enterprise, non, you know, not not your digital natives, not your tech forward companies typically wait until technology is ready for prime time, fully baked, a utility or a commodity before they're able to, um, you know, before they're interested actually in getting involved. Uh, when, a, when a technology is too new, there's quite a lot of risk associated with its involvement and, and they might not want to incur the risk or they might not actually have the talent to be involved in figuring out how to customize things. So they'll wait for an open source vendor to come to them or, or just a technology vendor to come to them and say, here's a package, turnkey, install, we have your back, we're all good. Um, that makes sense, except there's this lost opportunity um, where there's all this great innovation that happens before the utility uh, of or the commoditization of this technology. And all of that opportunity uh, requires companies to think about, well, how would we participate earlier in the process? How could we get involved in an open source community? Uh, and what about all those open source projects that don't have vendors uh, to support them? They're just not, th 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 there's just no economic model. So sure, for Hadoop and Kafka uh, and Cassandra, I, I have various vendors I can go to that would provide support. But for hundreds of node modules or thousands of node modules, I really don't necessarily have like a vendor to go to. So. I'm going to need to think about how I participate in the non-commodity space anyway. The moment you start shifting there, you're really talking about a different mindset of technology. With that, let me ask if you can get to the next slide. Um, you start thinking about like the tech company. So the tech company. So what do we think? You know, what do we think when we think about a tech company? There's a stereotype. Thank you to the movie industry. Uh, for giving us a stereotype where you know it's a it's a guy with a hoodie and a, a hipster coffee, um, and there's something there's something to be said about um, that stereotype is is having validity, but I don't think that's an operational uh, definition. That that doesn't like it isn't like it isn't all like that, and and it isn't helpful necessarily to just leverage the stereotype. It's a little more helpful to think about um, how companies leverage technology. And whether they see it as a utility, the way you might see an electrician coming to fix something in your house, you know, somebody who certainly understands electricity, but you're not, you know, differentiating your home existence based on the quality of electrician who comes in. It's just something that you need. You need a new socket. Somebody, there's plenty of people who know how to fix it. And similarly, many companies view technology that way. We need a website. Get me 10 people and build me a website. Or we need a we need a mobile app. Let's hire an agency and they'll build us a mobile app. 
And for those companies, technology really is utility. But as you shift into the left side of that adoption curve, you start recognizing that pre-utility technology requires people who can tinker, who can open things up, who aren't going to like say, oh, this, this commodity doesn't work. Let me toss it, go back to the van and get a new one. But actually, let me open this up and pull out the soldering gun and, and figure out how to make this work op optimally. That's a different kind of engineer. And it's not to say that they're necessarily better, but they operate differently because they're in a different part of the technology adoption curve. They have, they have different abilities um, and different needs. And as companies shift into that part of the industry, they need technologists that can operate differently than their other IT um, professionals who who can you know manage the network and the uh, you know the conference room and laptops, etc. So when I say tech you know tech company, I'm really talking about the mindset that create that leverages technology to create opportunity, as opposed to the mindset that creates a product idea first and then hires technologists to implement it. Um, most companies need both. Many companies only have one. And OSPOs come in when companies say, we actually need to create technologies. We need to leverage open source more strategically than just round up the uh, right number of vendors. Okay, so how, how do you um, talk about tech companies and, and your desire and aspiration to be one in public? So with that, let me ask you to, Anna, if you can advance this next slide. Um, let me talk about branding. So traditionally speaking, companies have um, multiple types of brandings, but let me look at the, the two largest types of brandings that, that we talk about. One is the corporate brand. Like, what does this corporation stand for? And the other is a product brand, which is, what is this product for and who is it for? And they're different, you know, these are different exercises um, company brands uh, advertise themselves and, and manage the messaging, uh, not just for customers, but for investors and for the community and for employees. Like this is this is who we are. This is what we stand for as a company. And they're largely enduring messages over time. Whereas products are a lot more focused on the target audience of a product. And for a large corporation, they may have many different target audiences. So the product brands could actually be quite different from their corporate brand, maybe not in opposition to, but it's a different kind of activity. And you'll find, organizationally speaking, the folks in the corporate branding, PR, analyst relations, investor relations, and you know the at, at that level of the organization, in many cases sit in a different part of the org than the people who are in product marketing or product branding, who are usually closer to the product. So that's kind of traditional stuff. But if you click again, please, there are other types of branding activities that happen. In some cases, they happen implicitly. Um, and, and what I'm suggesting is that let's just be explicit about it. So for example, companies have employer branding where there's activities that they impress upon the employees that this is a great place to work. It's sort of why you many companies have a company store and sell swag with a company logo on it. Most of those, most of those T-shirts are worn by employees, right? Not by customers. Um, it's sort of a branding saying, "I am proud to work at this company. My company does great things," and companies spend a bit of effort on reinforcing that. Similarly, there's this new quadrant. I'll call it new, but I think we do it implicitly, and I'm suggesting we do it more explicitly around tech branding, where we communicate not just to our employees, but actually to the tech marketplace that we're a home for tech talent. We're a partner for technology. So we'll show up at meetups, we'll speak at conferences, we'll sponsor foundations and activities in public, we'll host public hackathons and things like, uh, we'll publish open source projects, not just for people to engage, in some cases just as a badge to show that we can or, or that we publish uh, research papers. I mean, part of it is the actual, I mean, most of it is the actual value of the engagement, but. But part of it is the, the positive branding and impression that the corporation makes that brings talent um, and an opportunity and partnership and, and whatnot to the, to the experience. So that's what I mean when I talk about tech branding. I mean a type of branding that is distinct from the corporate brand because your corporation may be a retail company or a bank 
or, uh, or a telephony company, but your tech brand focuses on the technologists, just like your employer brand focuses on the employees. You have a variety of employees. You have a variety of tech people as well. Okay, next slide, please. So we wanna hire tech people. And I thought to myself, well, what do tech people want when they look for a job? Um, they want a good job, a fulfilling career. They want the respect and appreciation of their peers. The managers like them. They want a salary. And then it occurred to me, actually, um, everybody wants that. It's not unique to tech people to want that. I mean, that's sort of what a good job is. And I don't think tech people are unique in that way. But tech people may be unique. Um, in, well, I wouldn't say, I guess I wouldn't say unique in this way, but maybe what distinguishes tech people from anyone looking for a job that wants you know appreciation salary career opportunity etc is they want to make sure they're they're at a company that understands them that understands their aspiration their need for technology growth um, in particular in the open source world they understand what it means to be a developer who works on open source projects and who has that balance between contributing internally to the projects they, they're responsible for, but also having an external personal brand uh, or relationship to, um, to projects that are important to them and to the company as well. Uh, if a company wants to attract great developers, great open source developers in, in particular, they not only need to ensure that they're providing fulfilling career, respect, appreciation, and all the things that you need for, for a good job, but they also need to convey, to signal, and, and for it to be authentic, that, um, that they recognize that the tech people want a home where they're appreciated for what they bring to the company and that they'll be supported. And I think that's part of, part of the goal of tech branding is to show the world or the tech audience that we are the kind of company that does uh, have this, that does ha uh, have these features, so that you who may be looking for your next career move would wanna consider us, even though maybe you, you hadn't before. Now you might want to consider us because um, we actually are the kind of company you would wanna work at. That's sort of the message. Okay, next slide, please. How do you go about doing that? So um, in my in my last uh, company, we, we had that as well, and it's not, and, and the challenge there wasn't that people didn't know that we were a tech company. Uh, the company had gone through a, a number of name changes. There was mergers and, and acquisitions. And um, so there was a little bit of a brand uh, uh, erosion that we needed to restore and say, no, 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 we're still around. Um, in, in the OSPO that I'm in now, the, the situation's a little different. And I think in, in your OSPOs, if you run an OSPO, your situation may, may differ, but this playbook uh, I think works well in all. And the playbook focuses on the, the concept that a good branding activity is a, sort of a binary activity in that there's speaking and listening. Um, to speak, you have to have something to say, something worth sharing. And to listen, you have to be where the conversations are. You have to show up because you can't listen if you aren't there, right? So you get there by having things to say. And uh, from an OSPO perspective, we had, and I'm hoping to hire somebody who will who will help me in this case, uh, manage, well, what are the topics that we have um, in our company that we have something to say about? You know, what are we actually uniquely great at and have something that we're willing to share um, that represents our technology contribution? It's not going to be everything, but it should be a few. And then who in the organization are the go-to people that represent those topics well? And in that case, you would have maybe multiple lists. There's sort of your A list of people who are, you know, actually responsible, the architects or, or whatnot responsible for your cloud initiative or your AI initiative or whatever it is. But you might also have a B list and a C list of people whom you want to um, mentor and evolve into becoming that next generation. And you would use this playbook to get them to speak at various events, maybe the smaller events, to get them up to speed to then you know speak at the at the larger ones which brings to the third the channels where do you show up um ooh, there we go sorry um <clears throat> and then who do you show up with so we literally have a spreadsheet of 
all of the conferences sorted by topic with the CFP dates and the locations so that we can look in the beginning of the year and strategize and say, you know, here are the five conferences around data, big data and AI. Here are the six conferences around networking technology. Here are the three conferences around, you know, whatever mobile technology that, that are in our space, that are in our region where we're hiring, um, that, you know, we've already maybe attended. Here are the partnerships we might want to have with the host organizations that are sponsoring it. And here are the people that would be qualified. Let's get ahead of this and actually ask them, would you be prepared to speak on a topic in a conference in July about this? Have that conversation in January. And that's quite a shift of thinking because for many companies, um, the, the process of getting people to speak at conferences is a, is a permissioning activity. It's like, if I want to speak at a conference, I have to ask somebody permission, show them the slides and get approved to speak as if like, you know, I'm going to say something bad and they're, they're, going to, they're going to protect the company to make sure that I didn't. But yet speaking at these conferences is a value to the company. If we get in front of it and say, here are the topics that we want to be known for and here are the people that we want to promote and here are the channels, the, the meetups, the blogs, the podcasts, the astrology, you know, the various places that we want to show up and interact, we can. And by being there, we can also listen. Okay, so let me sort of take this to the next slide, which is um, what does this mean for the open source engineer or the engineer who is open source friendly or interested? I believe you're going to want to work at a company that that recognizes and respects that open source talent that you bring to the table. Um, but who are you and how do you show up? So let me suggest that there's actually a couple of different ways of showing up because we're all different and the needs differ. So you may be sort of your fungible, sort of what companies think is the fungible full stack developer that can sort of do a little bit of anything, but you happen to be familiar with open source and that familiarity Familiarity with open source is a differentiator for you. It shows that you can code uh, in public, and that you can code with teams, um, and that you you know that you have certain um, abilities that if you have never been an open source, you might not have exercised those. So that alone is good. But you may actually be a maintainer on a project we care about, which is even more special. So if your company is using you know X Y Z, Cassandra, Kafka, you know uh, Spark. Uh, superset, whatever, um, you might want to hire somebody who's actually a committer on one of those projects or somebody who could become involved in those projects as, um, as you know, an involved person who maybe grows their skills and earns, uh, earns a position in the community to advocate, you know, on behalf of the company's needs for growth in those technologies. So that's actually a very very targeted role as opposed to the general role. And then there's sort of like this other sort of role, which is to actually work at the ASPO itself, because the ASPO itself needs all types of people to um, enable technology development uh, within corporations, whether those be products and services uh, or activities with open source projects that we use or that we've published. So there's quite a bit of opportunity to work in a modern uh, corporation if you are if you sort of identify as an open source type of engineer. Um, and what I would do is if you just click, I'm going to just throw a, a very nice little plug. Um, my company is hiring uh, for all these kind of roles. So uh, if you want to um, reach out to me directly or go to the career site of my company, uh, usbank.com slash careers, we actually have have jobs. So if if you're here listening to this because you actually wanted to grow your career in an open source friendly company. Um, many open source friendly companies, many of the companies in the to do group and who are involved in Linux Foundation are actually those companies that either already are well established or uh, emerging to become. Uh, and I represent one of them. So I would, I would hope that you take a look at uh, what we have to offer. So with that, that's the that's the part of the you want to get a job. Let me just as a nod, and again, with apologies to Leslie, um, who wasn't able to be here, but just as a nod to the conversation that I think um, she may uh, have brought to the table, and I'll, I'll do my best to sort of just share some thoughts. Now that you've arrived at a company, 
you are now working at a great company that you've selected and you're an open source friendly person and the company is open source friendly. Um, so what do you do? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share a piece of, of advice for what it's worth and then, and then we'll go to the, the Q&A session if there are questions. I don't know if there's any lined up yet, but hopefully, hopefully you'll put some questions there. Um, I'll tell you what I think your first question shouldn't be. And, and I'll tell you this because I've heard this as a first question from many people. Your first question when you interview or start a, in a company should not be, am I allowed to participate in open source projects that I'm personally involved in while at work? That should not be your first question. It may be the first thing on your mind, but I wouldn't ask that as your first question because it conveys a sense of my interest is really about my personal aspirations outside of the workplace. My suggestion is, is that your first question is a lot more like, in what way can I leverage my participation in open source to help further our project's goals? Like, could I be looking for open source projects that would help our mission? Or would it be helpful if I joined some of these open source projects that we're dependent upon? Because I'm pretty good with open source, I think I can help. Then maybe a couple of weeks later, you can ask the question, you know, by the way, what's the policy on, you know, when I can, when I work on private things, do I use my email address? Do I not? Like, you tell me how you want me to do that. Um, and it's usually, I mean, there's, there's hopefully some sort of policy about it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't lead going into a company saying, um, thank you for the salary. I want to work on the projects I care about because <laughs> the reality is, is that they've hired you to work on the projects they care about. What you want to do is bring your open source success. D don't, don't make this like either you work in open source or you work for the boss. I think what you want to do is say, I want to work for this project by leveraging what I can do in open source. And to me, I think that brings your open source skills along with, with your new role. So that's my suggestion. Um, your company may not be as open source friendly as it posed itself to be. Um, and when that happens, you may need to reach out to allies in the company that are sort of acting as open source advocates, sort of like shadow ASPO or pre-ASPO uh, friends and allies. So reach out to them because they can help you. And when you really need help, come back to the to-do group and to ASPology and, and find the materials that we're creating here so that you could uh, bring some of the inspiration and education and advocacy to your company and then engage in the conversation. Like, why aren't we there yet? And what do we need to do? And what's holding us back? Is it, you know, is it right? Is it, well, are we ready yet? And what can we do to be successful with open source? So that's the end of the prepared stuff that I had. Um, and I'm glad to entertain conversations and questions. Um, and then uh, I think there was one other resource slide. Uh, the to-do group had already published some guides, um, recruiting open source developers, right, participating and building leadership. Those are already available on the Linux Foundation site. So if you wanted more, please, please visit those guides because they're actually quite good. Um, and with that, uh, any questions? Oh, I think we need to start the Q&A tab. There we go. I started the Q&A tab. So sorry if there, were, um, if there were questions that you wanted to line up. Uh, I don't know if someone said, I, I don't think there are any Q&A questions. Um, I personally have one question. <laughs> so, because sure. um, you mentioned you were in Yahoo and then you moved to US Bank that is quite different as you have mentioned. And when, right now you, I, uh, you mentioned that you're um, uh, hiring and managing talent in, uh, and try to find this open source specialist to have in, in US Bank. So my question is, um, have you been facing uh, any challenge that you would like to share here, like uh, something that is quite different from well, working at Yahoo at OSPO and then here at US Bank? Uh, I know you are starting, so I, I'm not sure if you have any experience already. I'll, I'll share what I I'll share um, what I can. Uh, I'm very fortunate that the executives um, recognize the importance of open source 
and had identified it as one of its strategic uh, pillars of our larger modernization effort. And they did that, I mean, they did that before uh, we started the ASPO. In fact, they, they were the ones who recognized we need an ASPO, right? Because there's this opportunity um, and open source doesn't just magically happen. It's, it's awesome, but it doesn't magically happen. We need to actually put together some people who can uh, work with the existing structures. I mean, the organization has all these existing structures with the you know, legal folks and enterprise architecture folks and risk management folks and security. Like there's all of these uh, functions that, that exist today and open source is certainly not new, but there's a, a specialty around understanding the nuances of open source, especially the pre-utility type technologies. So it's not like a vendor who gives you a package and upgrades it every six months, but but projects and th that project interaction. So that the, the depth of experience in that area and the st strategic implications um, was new and very welcomed um, by the by the executives. That being said, um, change is hard. Uh, you know, organizations organizations you know have a challenge with changing because um, you know they're used to ways of doing things. So. Creating organizational change or sort of change management um, is a process that requires really understanding, you know, what is the process today? Why is it here? What are the things that are good versus not good? Um, you know, how do we keep the good across the change, but not keep the not good? Uh, you know, making the change exactly there uh, is a process and that requires wisdom, um, time, support. So I think, um, so I think, you know, we have our work cut out for us. But I wouldn't, but I would say, and I think that's a natural thing, but we're very fortunate to have um, the support. If, if we did not have executive support, it would be very difficult uh, to do this. Um, we have a new question from, uh, yeah, the question is, what's the biggest uh, roadblock to finding acceptance? Uh, beyond executive funding from stakeholders within an organization that is starting out with an OSPO? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that, Preet. Um, I'll say that uh, I think that there are different types of organizations and that the roadblocks that you'll get sort of follow based on the type of organization that you're dealing with. So um, if you're dealing with an organization that's um, very bureaucratic in nature. It's very process focused where everything, like, there's a way of doing things. When you introduce a new way, you have to figure out how to do it within the context of you know, the bureaucracy. So if everyone's, if everyone's used to following a 14 step process and you say, no, I do it this way, well, you're gonna need to introduce a 14 step process because that's, that's what they're used to following. Um, if you're in an organization where things are you know, very generative, very um, like, we're just gonna grab the attention that we can and launch something because what we really need is a minimal viable product and get attention from the VCs to get more funding, but quality isn't really the issue, then um, then some, I'm sorry if that's a little stereotypical, but if, if you're at that stage of, of the startup sort of uh, initiative where um, speed is, is just more important than process, then the challenge for an OSPO is to keep up and is to be part of, you know, part of that. So I think that what when ospos form themselves in organizations they need to take a little bit of like uh what do they call industrial and organizational psychology uh in addition to all the technology and open source expertise they need to understand the nature of their organization how it operates and then within that context recognize how to be successful obviously if an organization is is structurally um, difficult to make changes then then the ospo will have um, all the challenges that any other initiative, like even if you like rolled out Agile or rolled out rolled out any sort of initiative, um, there wouldn't be a unique challenge to an OSPO. It would just be uh, figuring out how to make it work within the organization. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, no more questions. Um, yeah, well, Preet said that. Thank you so much, and it does. <laughs> okay, I mean, listen. So here's I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat the pitch again. In that I happen to be uh, hiring, but I also know that all of my peers are too. So I don't want to I don't want to you, you know over over leverage this, but I do want to remind tech people, even if you're not a coder. 
but you're in the open source world, if you're the kind of person who would join this conversation, um, there's a great career path for you. And, and uh, in many companies, not just not just the sort of well-known tech companies, but even uh, even the other companies that are recognizing the importance of technology. So I hope uh, if you're looking that you find, and if you're running an OSPO, I hope that this in, in creating what you need uh, in your OSPO. Well, so I think we don't have too much time now. So um, if there is no more questions, I'm just gonna share with you the last slide that is the next apology um, meeting that will be in October. It's already um, published. And this apology meeting is gonna be about the state of OSPOS of this year. As you know, the Twitter group every year uh, launches a survey. We had the results. We are working on that to, to have a list of insights that probably we will share in um, the upcoming OSPOCONS and also we will recap and share uh, in the next OSPOLOGY meeting for all the community. So registration is now open, so feel free to, to go there. And I think that's, that's all for today. Thank you so much, Gil, for sharing your expertise here. I think it's, it was a really nice um, session.